So now I'm ready to go ahead and apply those depth maps that I rendered in each of my programs. Just to refresh your memory, I'm going to go ahead and grab those depth maps, bring them to the front, and make them visible. You can see that the depth maps look a little different in DAS Studio than they do in Poser. In fact, they're exactly opposite. In Poser, we used it that we used it. We used that script to generate our depth map, which made objects in the back very dark and objects in the front very light. And in DAS Studio, we used the fog camera to do exactly the opposite. Um, before I go ahead and apply the depth maps, and part of the reason that we use the depth maps instead of rendering them within the programs themselves is it gives us a lot more control uh, in allows us to instantly see the effects. Um, just remember that when you apply these maps, Photoshop is going to think of black or white being absolutely crystal clear and shades of gray as being blurrier. So in the DAS Studio version, the things that are darkest are the things that are going to be crystal clear. So when I look at this, I can see that my main figure, the pixie here and her dragon, they are not perfectly black. So I want to change that. I'm going to use the levels um, adjustment to change just the levels on this depth map. So I'm going to hit Control L, bring up the levels tab. And now it's really just sort of a matter of squashing all that light and dark data together. And if I do this enough, now you can see very clearly that everything in the foreground is very dark and it will all be crystal clear. You might want to, and in fact we will, eventually make things in the very foreground, like those blades of grass, also appear blurry. Because when you're taking an actual picture where you had that depth of field blur, um, you have a crystal clear part of the image in the center and then things moving away from it in either direction um, can appear very blurry. But for um, for the way that we're going to do this in Photoshop, we kind of have to do the foreground and the background as two separate blurs. So this looks really good for the DAS Studio um, Z-Depth map. Uh, the important stuff is nice and black. So that's good. I'm going to hit OK. In the poser version, you can see she's already pretty well white. Um, I actually kind of want to bring out a little more contrast so that there's more blur, um, that there's, basically I want to make it have a smaller f-stop. And in photography, the f-stop is, is the amount of um, focused information that there is. A very small f-stop means that you have a very small slice of your image, which is in perfect uh, clarity. And then everything beyond that gets blurry far more quickly. So I, I want to make this image more contrasty. Um, and I can do this either using the layers or using brightness um, and contrast. And in fact, I probably will end up doing a little bit of both. So I'm going to start with the brightness and contrast. And this is one of those places where the legacy information is actually pretty useful. Um, if I brighten it up a lot, maybe not that much. Make it very contrasted. There you go. So a lot of contrast obviously makes things in the background get very dark very quickly. Um, She's pretty white, uh, which is what we want. The white objects in this image will be very, very clear. And if you don't get what you want on the first try, you can always um, either undo with your history states. You can kind of keep adjusting to your heart's content until you get exactly what you're looking for. But I, I think I'm pretty pleased with the way it is. That looks good. She's very, very bright and white. And over here, she's very, very dark and black. So what we need to do is take that depth information and we're going to turn it into a separate channel. Um, the channels tab was something, it is still something that I don't use uh, in a tremendous capacity, but it's a great way to store some additional information about your image. So I'm going to take this depth um, information and in my channels, I'm going to actually add another channel. What's in there now is the information in your image about what's red, green, and blue. Now, with the depth ma mask um, 
selected everything looks the same because it's all black and white. But if I go ahead and make this invisible and I, I look at the image that has the color information, you can clearly see um, I can look at just the parts of the scene that are red, the parts that are green, the parts that are blue, or you can see them all together. What I want to do is take this black and white Z depth information and I'm going to control A to select it all, control C to copy, and then in my channels tab down here in the bottom just like we could make a new layer we're going to make a new channel and it automatically is um, calls its Photoshop calls it alpha 1 which is perfectly fine call it whatever you want and then I'm going to paste that information in there and so now we have red green and blue but we also have this extra alpha channel before I flip back over to my layers tab sort of an important note that's easy to get mixed up on is if I don't come back up to the top and select all three of those channels together, red, green, blue. Um, things can get a little messy when we get back over to our main uh, render, and I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So if I had left it on the alpha channel, and I walked back over here, okay, I didn't really walk, but you get the idea, and suddenly I, I decide, oh, I don't want to see the z-depth, I turn it off. But I'm not seeing anything else underneath it. Where's my color information? Well, the information's all there, but right now you're only looking at that alpha channel. You need to look at all of it. So don't forget after you add that depth information to just click back up on the top so that everything you see from this point um, includes all of the color information. And I'm done with the z-depth map. Now I can kind of just drag it down to the bottom and not worry about it. Um, so now what? Well next we're going to uh, use that alpha channel that we just created to add a lens blur to our image. So adding that lens blur is uh, is very easy. We're going to start by selecting the layer that we want to add that depth of field blur to. And to start with, I'm just going to add it to my color layer. If I like it, then I'm going to go ahead and apply it to the occlusion layer as well. And that's sort of a word of caution. If you don't apply it to the occlusion layer, you end up with those shadows that are very crisp, where the rest of the scene is very blurred and things can get a little goofy looking. So don't forget, once we apply it to um, our color data, we will also apply it to our shadows. So up here in the filters menu, remember I have the right layer selected. I'm going to select blur, lens blur. And it'll render a preview quickly here of what it's going to look like with that depth information added to it. By default, at least, it um, Photoshop remembers the last thing that you did. So obviously the last thing I did here was in Daz Studio. Um, by default, it popped up with this little invert button unchecked. Just remember that if you're a Poser user because you're going to need that in a second. Um, and it gives you the source of the information that has that depth um, channel in it. And we just added that alpha channel so our depth map information is there and you can see already that that blur is being applied. Um, the focal distance allows us to change essentially which shade of gray is the crispest. So if I change this um, too far suddenly the parts that should be sharp are blurry and vice versa. I'm going to leave that at zero because I did a pretty good job of making sure that the things I wanted to be crisp were crisp. Um, the shape that it uses to render uh, those depth maps is kind of up to you. Um, it changes the quality. I like to use the triangle mostly because I, send, I, I tend to get fewer strange artifacts where things um, are very blurry. The thing that really controls how much blur that you have is the radius. How many pixels out does that blur extend into um, when it sees different shades of gray? So at zero, you can see that um, there is no blur at all. If I drag it all the way up, then things get really, 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 really blurry in the background, and it's kind of unrealistic. So this is something that's completely personal preference. Um, and the more that you kind of um, play around with it, the more of a feeling you'll get for what you want it to look like. And this is good, you know. Um, usually somewhere between 20 and 
maybe 40. Depends on how much depth your image really has in it. That looks good. And these other things also allow you to change um, some of the things like the brightness of your specular highlights brightens up the bright parts. Of course, that's a little overkill. Um, you can add noise to your image as you do so, but I generally pretty much just leave everything else exactly the way it is. I change the radius, um, and if I'm doing this in Poser, which you'll see in a second, I, I also pay attention to that invert button, but this looks good. Uh, and if you don't know if you like it um, compared to the original render, you can always flip the preview on and off. So that's what it would look like without the blur, and that's what it looks like with the blur. It's subtle, but um, looks pretty good. Okay. Um, so now you'll see that that um, lens blur has been applied to the color information. But if I zoom forward, I'm going to use the control key and slide my zoom button in here. When you look really closely, you can see in the background that the shadows have not been blurred just the color information. That's because our occlusion layer here is still without that lens blur applied to it. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and it, you don't even, if you've done the lens blur once, the, the last filter that you used pops up at the top of your filter menu. So you just click it and it'll apply the exact same lens blur to the occlusion layer that it did to the one underneath it. So together, now they look nice and smooth. Um, so that's what it would look like in Daz Studio. The only difference between doing this in Daz Studio and doing this in Poser is that in Poser, black is the blurry part and white is the not blurry part. So I'm going to go ahead and drag that depth map down so that, um, well, let's go ahead and copy it first and add that channel paste that information to the, oh, oops, <laughs> wrong one, I forgot to copy. Um, so I'm going to copy the depth, mayor, la depth layer, paste it into my alpha map, copy, paste, so there it is. And um, just like we did in Daz Studio, I'm going to take the lens blur uh, filter and apply it, but the only difference here is, um, well, first of all, I'm applying this to the depth map, which is not what I want, but you can also see pretty clearly that the white parts are still blurry here. And remember, in Poser, it should be exactly flip-flopped. So drag this down, select the layer, oops, multiply, select the color layer. And now when I apply that lens blur, Here's where I click that invert button. And as I do that, you'll see right away everything straightens out and the background is blurry and the foreground is crisp. And again, you can kind of play around with um, how much blur that you want. I'm going to leave this just the way it is because that looks just fine. Um, and again, don't forget to apply that same lens blur to your occlusion layer so that everything blends together um, nice and evenly. So at this point, I am going to um, pretty much continue to work just on the Daz Studio version of this because now the two images are identical. They've both had the lens blur applied to them and they both have the occlusion layer over the top. So that's about the only differences between starting your post work in Daz Studio and in Photoshop. So now we will continue with um, the rest of the post work process.